Welcome to the Accidental Experts Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Hamilton. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a child and family therapist. I have been in practice for over 15 years, and I'm also a mom of four. So I know the challenges both professionally and personally. I'm so glad that you're here today to grow your parenting toolbox. Please come as you are and be ready to learn. My goal is to make you the accidental expert so that you can raise healthy humans. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're with us today. So today I have a special guest and her name is Anne Moss Rogers, and she is a mom who lost her kid to suicide. And she is going to talk to us about this experience that she's had and what she has learned and help us to help our kids by sharing her story. With that, let's get to Anne. Thank you. I appreciate your having me, Bryce. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about a suicide and suicide awareness. And this topic is really personal to you. So can you tell us about what led you to be such an advocate and somebody who's really um, embracing the importance of education around suicide? Well, my son died by suicide. So I didn't feel like I was qualified to talk about it for a number of years um, until I had adequate training, until I talked to people with lived experience, until I read enough books, took enough classes. I had, it's an uncomfortable topic, right? It's not mm-hmm. one we all want to talk about. And when people broach the subject, it can kind of suck the air out of the room. So I also had to kind of figure out how I was going to manage that feeling. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I was just going to launch forward with it. And I just figured out how to deliver it in such a way that people ended up, you know, telling me their story or sharing that, you know, a friend had lost someone or they had, it's touched almost everyone's life. I mean, there, there isn't anybody in the United States that didn't touched about, you know, by it in some way. So I guess that's pretty much where I started was a newspaper article that I wrote that went viral. And before that, I didn't realize that nobody was really being emotionally naked about this topic, they came at it from kind of, well, here are what you see, you know, here are the signs, here's what they say. But nobody was really telling a lot of personal stories at that point. And I remember um, watching, you know, Kevin Hines, and he was talking as an attempt survivor, but I wasn't seeing that many lost survivors. And I think they probably were. I just hadn't run into them at that point. I mean, my son Charles died by suicide at the age of 20 years old. He struggled with depression, uh, anxiety. Uh, You know, then he started to get into drugs and alcohol. And I couldn't figure out why he was doing that. We had talked about that. We talked about the dangers, you know. I felt like I'd done everything right as a mother. Mm -hmm. And yet he went down that path. And I would find out later that he was using drugs and alcohol to numb those feelings of suicide. And, you know, I can get that. In the moment, I guess it does work in a way. I mean, of course, Mm -hmm. it's really what drove his suicide in the end because when you go through withdrawal, that's a heightened time of risk. And that's when he took his life. And, you know, I didn't know any of this. I didn't even know he had thoughts of suicide until they told me he died by suicide. And it really took years for me to piece it all together. And also to recognize all the signs that there were. And I mean, tons of them. And he wrote about it, and I didn't see his lyrics until after he died. And I was able to kind of include those lyrics in my first book, Diary of a Broken Mind, because I think we needed my perspective, but we also needed his, Mm -hmm. even if it wasn't flattering. And there are some songs that are sweet and, you know, I love you, mama. And then there's songs where 
he is really pissed off. And I needed, I needed to own up to that and realize how he felt too. And the, mm -hmm. the amount of shame he felt. And I think that one of the things I did a lot of that I had started to change and recognize it wasn't working, but that kind of cheerleading him or pushing him into the light when, you know, you have depression, you get episodes of depression, you have to work through it, you have to take medication or whatever, you know, uh, set of things work for you. But with Charles, I didn't, he wasn't diagnosed. And I thought, well, he just needs to pull himself out of whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I kept asking for a diagnosis and everybody, oh, he's not depressed. Mm -hmm. You know, why didn't they do a psychological evaluation? Yeah. I just, and going into that grief process, I, I would never wish that on anyone. I, it was... When they told me he died, I thought, sure, it was overdose. And when they told me it was a suicide, I just, I, it didn't even penetrate. I couldn't breathe. I, I swear I didn't breathe for a whole minute. I am watching my husband have this emotional explosion going, why is he having that emotional explosion? Mm -hmm. And then it, when it kind of sunk in, it was like this extra twist of the knife because I thought, it felt like he had done this to me mm. or I didn't love him enough. So therefore it was my fault. And how could he leave us this way? You know, didn't he know how much we loved him? And it would take me a long time to understand why suicide. Um, but that would, you know, but those were my first feelings and it really took years to work through the coulda, woulda, shouldas and the punishment and I'm a terrible parent and, and all that stuff. Yeah. I think there's such a stigma around this. I oftentimes, you know, see in the news or hear of other people who their loved one, whether it be an adult or a child has committed suicide and they don't want to name it. And I certainly understand that that is really hard, but I think it is keeping other people from understanding how big of a problem this is and also keeping people from being able to talk about it. It kind of puts them in a position of like, they have to keep a secret. Do you notice uh, that? Oh yeah, I definitely do. And if I could go back for a minute and say, I really want your audience and everyone listening today to use died by suicide and not committed mm -hmm. because it's not a crime. It used to be, and that's where committed came from. So it's been on our lexicon for like, you know, hundreds of years. So it's going to take a little time to work that out. But if we would say died by suicide, because it's a public health issue and not yes. a crime. You know, there is silence because one, people think that talking about might plant the idea in people's head. Mm -hmm. When it does the opposite, when we open the conversation, it starts to encourage people who are struggling. Okay, this is an okay topic. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity for me to tell and talk about it. And I, I didn't understand that. I always thought that like when my son put a song out there one time and it had shades of suicidality in it. And I'm like, he's going to make people kill himself by, by singing the song. And what he did is he made people feel less isolated in their feelings. Nobody who has suicidal thoughts invites those in or makes this decision. I'm going to be suicidal. It's like, their brains, it has to do with stress response and their brains are wired differently. And for whatever reason, they're just people who have them more often. Some people have them once in their life and it, it never returns. Some people twice, three times. Some people have it daily or mm -hmm. weekly. 
it's it just differs so vastly from person to person and it depends on you know do you have trauma in the background do they have mental illness like bipolar or depression and, you know it's always due to a constellation of risk factors that converge all at once so the silence has really been part of what increases it mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if we're exposed to it, it does heighten our risk for suicide. So if we go and talk about it in a school, talking about it doesn't increase the risk. It, it brings it down. However, being exposed to a suicide at a school does increase the risk, and it increases the risk for like years and years and years, and they call that cohort suicide. So like it we're not sure why, but uh, anecdotally, we all think it's basically because it just becomes another tool in the toolbox mm -hmm. once they've been exposed. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Well, let's just put that tool in our toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, so it does tend to make people more vulnerable when they are exposed to it yeah. in a family well or in a community. Absolutely. Well, and I think, you know, this idea of talking about suicide, not causing people to come to um, die by suicide, I think is such an important thing because so many parents are afraid to talk about these topics. But I think the reality is, is that our kids are on social media, our kids are on the internet, our kids are exposed to other kids and other adults and other situations. And we can't control the whole narrative of of what they're being exposed to. But the part that we can do is open up the opportunity to have conversations around it. And I think that part is scary for parents because also we grew up in a time where we didn't talk about it. Nobody talked about it. And if somebody died by suicide, it was kind of like there was a negative feeling to that. Um, and, and I think that's, I'm so glad that we're moving away from that because it really is, an amplification of their mental health crisis that they're in. And I think it's it's not done to anyone. It just seems like the only way out of the pain that they're experiencing. At least that's been my experience and and working with families and um, kids and teens who have had suicidal thoughts is it seems like the only way out and they just want relief. Um, and so I think that's why therapy also can be so important in the toolbox of giving other tools, because if we think that they're our only way out is to kill ourselves, then we're missing a lot of other tools. But if you haven't ever been exposed to them, then how do you know? Like it, kids are not often Googling, you know, it's how, how do I help myself feel better? I mean, sometimes they are, but I think it's yeah. like, how, how do I end this pain? And sometimes that leads them to something really unfortunate instead of opening up a door to a conversation to talk to their parent or a trusted teacher or, you know, find a therapist or things like that. What do you think is contributing to our mental health crisis? I mean, I would say we are in a mental health crisis um, in our society. What do you think is contributing to that? Well, when the digital age moved in, that would, <clears throat> which we thought would bring us together, really pushed us apart. So I think, um, it's the lack of connection and community. So we think that posting more, spending more time on Instagram is connecting. It's not. And we're often ignoring the people in front of us. Our kids also have less, and, and adults have less face time. And when you have less face time, you have fewer opportunities to develop healthy coping strategies. Because when I went outside in the 70s and I had that neighborhood of kids and friends and I got mad when Tommy Knox called me out in dodgeball. I was sure I was still in. I totally, you know, missed it. And he called me out and made me leave and I stalk off and I go home and I'm angry. They're the only friends I have. That is my summer entertainment. And if I cut them off, it's going to be a pretty boring summer. So I had to figure out how to negotiate my way back in. Mm -hmm. And those opportunities over and over and over are what build resilience. And there is an answer to it. We need to be more intentional about building those 
coping strategies and it, and into our parenting and into our schools and into our therapeutic sessions because that's the only way they're going to start learning them like kids learning mindfulness in in kindergarten and i really think before we even get to mindfulness we have to learn the pause we can't teach anybody anything if if they have impulse control issues they are at higher risk adults and children alike so we need to start teaching the pause as early as we can you know take that deep breath you know don't act right away you know, do the snow globe, wait till the, you know, little snowflakes come to the bottom and settle down. And, you know, then you can respond. So I really think the bigger picture is that, you know, we've just kind of fallen apart as a community and it's gotten, it's gotten kind of scary. And the pandemic just put its foot on the accelerator. So a lot of people think, oh, it's the pandemic. And that's the reason it was all happening before then. It's just foot on, pandemic was foot on the accelerator. Yep. I agree. I mean, I think we, we've been in this place. I, I've been in practice for 15 years and I have always been busy, right? But it's just more busy now. So, I mean, that tells me something of like, there's always been a need, right? It wasn't like it just showed up, but it has amplified for sure. And so I think I love this idea that you're talking about waiting and pausing. Uh, when I started this podcast, the very first episode I did was about having a pause button. And I encourage people yeah. to like take their pulse, right? Because to notice how it's racing, right? When they have a big feeling and then to wait until it settles to respond. And it's so hard because I think we're in such a fast driven society of like, we want our packages that we order online today, <laughs> right? We, we want the things right now and we want the solutions right now. And often in life, it's, it's the pausing is where we grow, right? The Where we can reflect and see what we've learned and maybe assess a situation, but it is hard to be in that place. And I do agree with you, especially on the disconnection of teens. I often will have teens in my office who will be like, I am playing video games online with my friends and that's how I'm connecting. And I'll be like, okay, that's cool that you're doing that. When have you seen your friend in person? And they're like, oh, at school. I'm like, no, I'm saying like outside of school, not on FaceTime, like in real life, like you could touch their arm <laughs> and they'll be like, well, it's been a couple of weeks. And I'm like, yeah, we need to work on that. Like, that's how you feel connected. And knowing that you have people to lean on is that physical presence in your life is how you know that you can lean on somebody. You're not going to call somebody at 2 a.m. when you're in crisis, if the only time you see them is on the screen or is through social media. I mean, I just don't find that kids do. I think I, it's that physical connection. And, and even with their parents, like I know that I have four kids and my kids ask for things at times that are the most inconvenient. Like it's never like they want to have this conversation when things are calm and settled. It's like, it's like the heightened, like everybody's hungry. Everybody's whatever, like tired. It's like, we need to have this big conversation. And so I think, as parents, just like remembering it, that part of like showing up in those moments also helps them to maybe come to us in the moments where they're having a hard time. It's it's not a full plan. There's no perfect plan. Um, and I think I want to amplify just this idea that like no parent that or family member that has had somebody die by suicide is their fault. It's it's a decision that that person's making based on the facts that they have at that time and feeling like that's their coping skill or how they solve this, but it can really stick with us. And, and for us to feel like we are somewhat responsible for that. Right. Unfortunate endings. Yeah, it is. So um, I'm always telling people to listen more and lecture less. I mean, what child has ever said, oh, my gosh, your words of wisdom, let me go write them down. I mean, oftentimes we'll do just the opposite. Mm -hmm. I stopped lecturing years ago um, when I came in one day and I said, it doesn't work. I'm not going to lecture anymore. My kids die laughing. And I'm like, no, really, I'm not. And they're like, yeah, you will. And I'm like, no, because y'all are going to help me. You're going to point out when I do. 
and I'm going to stop and I'm going to apologize. And that's the way I'm going to learn. Well, that I was giving them their power back, right? So let me tell you how they relished and loved that. And then I learned to just ask questions. Mm -hmm. I learned to allow those long stretches of silence of keeping my mouth shut and not filling it with words of wisdom that they didn't want to hear because that's when the magic was would happen. And with Charles, if I shot baskets or he liked to come talk to me in my office and he didn't always want me to turn around. Sometimes he wanted to talk to my back. Not always. Mm -hmm. Richard, my older son, if I go take a walk with him outside, he won't shut up the whole time. I love it. Oh, my gosh, it's wonderful. I can't even get a word in edgewise. So if I wanted to give advice, I wouldn't have been able to. So he prefers to have that conversation most of the time when he's not sitting right across from me. Mm -hmm. You know, the most intimate conversations have happened when we've gone to take a walk. So guess what I do when he comes and visits? He's 32 now. We are day, oh, let's go take a walk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I so, love that. Well, it's it's less intimidating, right? Like there's something right. about looking somebody in the eye and talking about things. I mean, that is an important part of life at times. But I think to open the door to conversation, hearing what they have to say is way more important than them looking in your you in the eyes. So I love that you found ways to get your boys to talk to you. Right. And of course, my younger one has died by suicide, but um we did have conversations and I miss the signs and I wish I would have asked, are you thinking of suicide? And I never mm -hmm. thought to ask that because it wasn't on my radar. Mm -hmm. It is now. And I'm here to put it on everybody else's radar. Yeah. So talking about that, what do you think we should be looking for in terms of signs or, or symptoms that are concerning? When should we be concerned about our kids in terms of maybe their mental health, but also just being aware of suicide being on their mind? Well, if there is a suicide at school, we need to jump right in and, you know, not probe, but just say and be more vulnerable. Like, gosh, I'm j it's just really hit me. I'm, I'm really feeling sad. I, I know how I feel. How do you feel? So you got to be vulnerable first before you start pummeling them with questions mm -hmm. and then they may not answer but by your sharing they won't they won't forget that but if they start isolating a lot and ghosting and that's not like them spend a lot of time in their room and they haven't before they stop doing activities they love and they don't replace it with you know teenage pursuits you know, you know, it's natural for somebody to say, oh, I love to draw. And then they get to be teenagers and they want to run cross country. But let's say they played the piano since they were three, never had to be told to practice, were passionate about it. And then they quit everything. That That's a sign. Mm -hmm. um, if they go to the doctor a lot, uh, the school nurse, if you know the first name of your school nurse and it's headaches, it's back aches, it's muscle aches, it's every flu and every cold, their immune system is down when they struggle with depression, but also anxiety brings headaches and muscle aches because you're tightening and clenching teeth. They're real symptoms. They're not fake. They're not psychosomatic. Um, drinking and drugging more. Um, taking unnecessary risks is another one. Like my son decided to get on the back of a car at 35 miles an hour and they were doing donuts in the street. And I'm like, that's really dangerous. Don't you know that could have killed you? Well, yeah, I knew that. So he was, when he was, had too much to drink, he was having passive suicidal thoughts. Well, if it happens, it happens. And he cracked his skull. So I still wasn't aware that he was suicidal. Okay, what do they say? They say things like, I can't do this anymore. I feel so worthless. I feel so numb. I am such a burden. Burden and worthless being huge red flags. Most kids who are struggling with thoughts of suicide are going to leave clues and invitations for you to ask. They want desperately to tell someone. And so 
I've had kids tell me they've left their internet search, you know, out in the open, hoping a parent will see it and ask them about it. They, like Charles talked about death a lot. Um, and I wish I would have said, so what, what made you bring that subject up? Ask with curiosity and compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not trying to cheerlead them out of the blues here. So it's really important. And we finally have to ask the question that we don't want to ask. Are you thinking of suicide? And no, it will not plant the idea in their head. If it is a younger child, and that younger child has just run out into the street and a car was coming and there wasn't really anything, you're like, they know better than that. Were you trying to make yourself dead? So it is, were you trying to make yourself dead if it's a child that's really young? Are you thinking of suicide? Are you thinking of killing yourself? You do not ask, are you thinking of harming yourself? That's different. If we want to know if someone is thinking of suicide, we must ask directly. You may feel like, oh, my gosh, what if they say, yes, I'm going to panic. Number one thing, do not panic. That is the number one reason kids do not want to tell their parents. They think you're going to panic, call 911, put them in the back of an ambulance. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And th they will not tell their therapist for the same reason. You're going to pick up the phone. The police are going to come because you're worried about your liability. So that's another reason patient might not tell you. So we need to be prepared to not panic. Take a deep breath. Just say, tell me more about how you feel. And then you can kind of calm yourself while you're listening. Because the number one thing you cannot do is panic. And you can say, you don't want to say you have so much to live for. You want to say, tell me more about how you feel. How long have you felt this way? How were you thinking of killing yourself? Because then you can remove the things from your home or secure things that are available because you want to put more time between thought and action. A lot of people think, oh, well, you know, if I take that away, they'll think of another way. And that's just not true. They usually have fantasized for a long time about that particular way to die. And so we need to make sure that your firearm is secured or not in your house at all. And you let your therapist know. So when they do the suicide risk assessment, then that is to figure out how suicidal they are. And, you know, it is open to interpretation. Um, then the safety plan, you know, uh, I've talked to kids about, okay, you're going to have that feeling of suicidality and you're going to want to drive in your car somewhere and um, do this act. What are some things in your mind that you can imagine will sort of stop yourself. And let's think about it now while you're in rational thought mm -hmm. and put it on the safety plan so that when you are in that moment of suicidality, it's kind of like training for something. It just kind of comes back to you. You know, how, what are you supposed to do at that suicidal moment? And one thing we need to recognize is the intense thoughts, even in a su suicidal episode, let's say it's 20 minutes, Let's say they have three peaks where the pain is really, really bad and the brain is telling them you got to die. That's the moment where you say this pain won't last forever and know that it will only last from 60 to 90 seconds. I can do this. I can do this and just cheerlead yourself, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, and people have tools and toolboxes and one person, she she wrote a letter to herself and she puts it in a box and she reads that. It's worked sometimes. It hadn't worked others. Mm -hmm. Calling 988-741-741, calling a trusted adult, uh, calling a friend. You know, what what are those safety net things you can do to keep yourself alive? Yeah, that's so important. I think... 
you know, having that plan in place ahead of time, right? Obviously, maybe we're not talking to our kids about a safety plan if they've never had suicidal thoughts, but I think it's good for us to talk about here are things that people can do when they do have suicidal thoughts. Like it's also normal for us to sometimes have a thought of this is really hard. I just want to get away from this, which doesn't mean that somebody has suicidal intent, but they may have a thought about I could die and then this would be over. And I think normalizing that part of like, we can have yeah. that. Um, and we can also like take one step forward, right? Or contact somebody, tell somebody we're feeling that way. Text a friend, say, I'm, I'm having a hard time right now, right? Like getting people involved so that we can have support m- makes those thoughts kind of dissipate a little bit because we're kind of changing the channel in our brain. We're not focusing on that one thought and it does pass. That's the good news is no feeling lasts forever. It is, it doesn't matter what it is. It, it does subside um, and and holding hope in that part of like, I can handle this and that it will get better, but also like having things to rely on. Like I like it, some kids don't like to go out and go for walks or whatever, but I think being out in nature is so restorative and that bilateral stimulation of, of walking helps our brain to kind of settle and process through things. And we can come back in a place where we're in a better spot, but sometimes it's coloring or doing something else. Even if that thought's in our, our mind, but we're doing something, it makes us feel like we have control and maybe that it would help us to not choose that life ending choice, right? To be in the place where that feels like the only option. So what do you think, what can parents, coaches, teachers, just our community do to support kids? And especially around this idea of having suicidal intent or um, people going through killing themselves by suicide. So I actually, while we don't, we talk about not doing a safety plan for everybody. I do a coping card with Mm -hmm. kids and it's like we're all gonna face adversity at some point so you as a family you know what are your strategies who would you talk to you know identifying your emotions and then you know having crisis lines so i actually call it the coping card and i I have it online and it's been this huge hit and on the other side you put um your book of wins what things are you proud of? You know, I make great pimento cheese sandwiches. I just shot the winning goal for, you know, the state nationals. Um, I just, you know, sewed a dress for my friend. You know, whatever it is, there are things you're proud of and you're excited about. One kid from the university that uh, I do a lot with NC State University, he said that I came from a foreign country. I had nothing. I didn't know where to go. This is all completely foreign to me. And here I am two years later. I'm still in the program. My grades are good. I still don't know where I'm going to live next year or how I'm going to pay for it. But I'm really proud of myself. Hmm. And that was uh, that was his book of wins. You know, I mean, and I was like, wow, how many people would also relate to that? So I think for that, it's a big question. Um so I think connection and belonging, anytime you can create connection and belonging in your family and in your school, um, parents asking more questions, going from that punitive parenting, which doesn't work for this generation, to more of a wisdom guide, and that is asking more questions mm-hmm. and allowing them to fail. We're afraid that failure is going to define their whole life and if they don't get in that college, I need to do this. We need to back off a little bit and let them let them learn because that's where we learn. And we need to tell kids that it's okay to fail. That's where mm-hmm. we learn. And we need to normalize that as well. So when I speak to schools, I'm usually saying connection and belonging. Um, we need to identify coping strategies and embed them in the system somehow. And it doesn't have to be, let me teach you this coping strategy, but modeling it, um, Mm -hmm. having games and activities that, you know, bring them together, but also teach them ways to cope. And then finally, you know, talking to someone is a sign of strength. 
and, you know, advertising that instead of its weakness. And I think those are the three most important components to the prevention piece. Mm -hmm. And we want to go way upstream. You know, we want to go way upstream way before they get to the point of crisis. Yeah. Yeah. I think early intervention with anything is obviously the most ideal um, setting. And so I think putting this as part of By preventing it, we're talking about it. We're educating kids about it. Because I think sometimes I hear kids say, I am the, I thought I was the only one who's ever thought this. Right. And it's, and it's, it's like, you know, as an adult, you're like, no. (laughs) Right. But then as a kid, it's like, you only know what you've seen or experienced. And so if you've never had anybody talk about the idea that sometimes we might have thoughts of hurting ourselves. So it's just harm or thoughts of killing ourselves and that that there's actually a name for that and it's called suicide. And this is what this is. And I talk to kids in my practice about educating them about those things, because I think it's really helpful and talking about like, you know, that it's really brave to talk to people about it. Like I always, whenever kids or teens tell me that they've been thinking about killing themselves, I will say, first, I just want to tell you, thank you. Like, thank you so much for trusting me to tell me that piece. Like, I just am so incredibly proud of you. And I think that part for some of them is like, they're like, why? And I'm like, because that means like, you're allowing me in so that I can help you. Like, and I want you to make it through this. Like this, this will make my year. Like, this is amazing that you were willing to tell me this so that I can help you and help you help yourself. And I think that's the important part is like, sometimes when we're over parenting, maybe when we're protecting our kids, too greatly. We also are not teaching them to trust themselves. Then they only trust us. But here's the reality. Uh, As parents, we're going to die at some point, right? However that looks. And so our kids cannot be only trusting us to live their lives. They have to trust themselves, which is probably one of the biggest gifts we can also give our kids is to trust themselves. Um, And I know that when we're having suicidal thoughts, that it trusting ourselves is a tricky place, right? Because our brain is telling us to kill ourselves. And, and also, so we don't want to be listening to that piece, but I think just generally when we're trusting ourselves, kids get that feeling of like, I want to tell somebody, I want somebody to know. I think when I talk to people about, um, sexual abuse, uh, suicidal thoughts, those things like, excuse me, our kids are leaving breadcrumbs, right? They, they want us to pick up on these things because they are afraid to tell because it does feel scary. It is scary. And that's okay that it feels that way, but it's also that they want us to say, Hey, you, you said that thing, like, tell me more about that. Or I'm curious about this. And, and I love this perspective of curious parenting. Like this is the collaborative parenting where we're helping kids to kind of raise themselves in a way of like, we're not the only person who knows something. Kids are really smart and they have lots of thoughts and they're really good at solving problems. Not all of them. And that's why we're here to help mentor and model things, but also like listening, they might actually have a solution to their problem. Right. Right. And I love that because then it's like, you can be like, "Um, you're so amazing. Like that was great. I love that you came up with that. And I think sometimes we don't think about that part because as parents, we've experienced a lot of things. And so we want to share our wisdom. But I remember when I was a teenager, my mom, I don't even remember what the topic was, but she was trying to like, tell me something. And I was like, mom, I just sometimes want to make my own mistakes. And it was like, one of those things where I'm like, back off, (laughs) you know, in the most loving way of like, I just need to make some choices. I hear what you're saying, but like also give me the space to make these decisions. So I think, yeah, that's an important part. And, And so like within our homes, and I think the curiosity might be the biggest thing that we can do, but also having more mental health support, right? And we're advocating for just knowledge of teaching kids about things, is there anything else that you feel like we can really do like at, at a bigger level, kind of like upstream to help kids more? Well, I think the listen more and lecture less, but understanding and appreciating their fears and listening without judgment and trying to fix like, I don't want to go to a psychiatrist, mom. And you, you know, it took you six months to get it. It was a lot of paperwork and you want to, well, we're going. Pull back and say, well, Why don't you want to go? Well, they're going to give me medication that makes me a zombie. Huh. And thought of that. Well, how about you write that down 
And can you ask, because I'm really curious, I have a list of questions too. Maybe we can put those questions together mm -hmm. because we're not going to make any kind of progress if you're not invested in the therapy that's suggested. So I can't make you do anything, mm -hmm. but I'd like for you to be open and go to this one session because I really need my questions answered. And I'm really curious about what the answers are to yours. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can ask the ones we've written down. So give yeah. them some agency in the process. Mm -hmm. I love that. Like, and I, I think that's the piece also is like fear based, right? And when we have a fear, then, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be a zombie. I would not want to take a medication that made me be a no. zombie. So I do not blame people for not liking that idea. But I also want to say, <clears throat> excuse me, to that point that if you have a psychiatrist or a primary care doctor that is prescribing medication to your child for a mental health thing, they should not be a zombie. If they're doing their job in a way that is supporting your child, they should be able to still feel like themselves. And I know that sometimes that is complicated and it takes like trial and error. I know medicine doesn't like it when we say error, but I think it's, it's trying it out to see what works with your body mm -hmm. chemistry. But like, we don't want kids to be zombies. We don't want adults to be zombies. We want them to be themselves because if they feel that way, they're going to stop taking the medication. That's at least my experience. When it feels right. bad, they don't want to do it. So then there's no purpose being met there. So it is so important that they're talking about how they're feeling. Do they think they could feel better? Do they think that they feel worse now? Do they think that they're having trouble sleeping? Do whatever it is, right? That they're expressing that part and asking those questions. Another question I also like is like, if a kid says, I don't want to feel like a zombie and it would be like, oh, I'm curious, like, where did you learn about that part? Like, where did that thought yeah. come from? Right. Because I think it's oftentimes social media, it's the news, it's a friend maybe that had Red, an experience. Reddit board, Instagram, <laughs> yes. Yes. Snapchat, you name it. <laughs> right. So, so it's, but it's like, okay, well, so that's a valid concern. So let's, let's ask the person who would prescribe the medication. And also you don't have to take the medication. If you get there and you talk to somebody and, and the things that they're saying don't jive with you. Okay. Right. No one, no one can make you do it. And so I think them having a choice is so important in that. Right. So how important do you think it is to be having these conversations with our kids? Oh, and about I think it's, I think it's critical. And you read something, you go to a talk, somebody dies by suicide that you know, have the conversation, start with how you feel. And, you know, have you ever had those feelings? Mm hmm. And when, and, you know, if you have, uh, you know, I did as a teenager once and they're going to be real curious. So mm -hmm. you can be vulnerable to a point. You don't want to overshare, but being vulnerable is okay. So I think having a conversation is critical. And I think that there's enough out there that sort of makes you think about it. And that's when you, I read this thing today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think about it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's great. And just like putting the information out there and then asking for their feedback on that. And you yeah. can say like, tell me more about that. Or I really want to hear about this. Or like, you have such a good perspective or like, that makes me curious to know what you think about this and allowing them to be in that place is so good. Okay. Well, let's um, summarize or end with what do you want parents to take away? I think the most important thing is listen more and lecture less. Use your ears more than your mouth because you have two of those and it, it, it's, tw you have twice as many ears as a mouth. And, uh, we, we need to allow them to feel heard. Yeah. I love this. Thank you so much for your time today. And Moss, it has been so enlightening and so helpful. And I love this reframing of died by suicide instead of saying, committed suicide. I think that reframe is, is great. And I'm going to take that and put that into practice. Thank you. You already have our, I mean, right after you switch, and I don't know how you switch that fast. Most people don't, but good for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Have a fantastic day. All right. Thank you too. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks again, Ann Moss. I know that this is such a very serious and hard topic, but it is so important because I think if we can do something to help protect our kids and help protect our kids 
friends and help protect our community, then we should do something about it. And I think that Anne Moss has given us a great path of how to help have these conversations with our kids, even though they may be hard and to help guide them through that, to get support and to love on them, to listen more than we talk and to get curious about what our kids think. With that, I will say thank you so much for your time today. Please rate and subscribe to our show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and keep the emails coming with the show topic requests to accidentalexperts at gmail.com. Have a wonderful day. Some words from our legal team. The information presented in this podcast is not intended or implied to be a substitute for appropriate professional advice, diagnosis, or treatment. All content, including text, graphics, images, and information contained on or available through this podcast is for general information purposes only. This podcast makes no representations and assumes no responsibility for the accuracy or information on or available through this podcast. And such information is subject to change without notice. You are encouraged to confirm any information obtained through this program with other sources and review all information regarding any condition or treatment with the appropriate professionals. What we're saying is, yes, I am a real therapist, but I'm not your therapist.